I'm Larry Goldstein. I'm a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at UC San Diego. And I'm pleased to be here interviewing Paul Berg in a second segment about Paul's experiences both originally in the uh, regulation of recombinant DNA, as you heard in the previous segment, and now I want to move him along to discussions of places where the original model of recombinant DNA has not worked as well, where the issues have perhaps been a little more socially complicated. Paul, you'll remember, is a Nobel laureate, uh, winner of the Public Policy Award of the American Society for Cell Biology, and in some ways a, a role model that many of us have sought to emulate in our dealings with the body politic and the press and everything else. So Paul, thank you for joining us again. Thank you. So, so you know, thinking about Asilomar and how Asilomar and recombinant DNA regulation really set the tone for scientists calling for regulation and driving the kind of regulation that has, uh, in fact, developed and been followed. I know that genetically modified foods and the stem cell debates have not lent themselves very well to that kind of model. Are there, are there principles, you think, or reasons why that, that has not worked so well in this yeah. context? So let me go back a little bit and yeah, say, sure. the scientists did not call for regulation. The Asilomar meeting was actually an attempt to bring out the various views from various yeah. constituencies and to try to assess, was there or was there not a risk? The assessment was there was some risk, yeah. but we could mitigate those risks by having these guidelines. Right. So the guidelines were a recommendation of how to proceed. Yeah. Now, if you look at some of the other issues that have confronted science and public policy, the one that was came shortly thereafter was genetically modified right. foods. Right. And the question was, there's lots of data that says it's safe, yep. and there's lots of public policy that doesn't want to have it in their backyard. Would an Asilomar meeting help, type meeting help, to bring together these two opposing views and try to develop some kind of consensus? Right. Right. And the answer that we found was they were almost irreconcilable views. And the views on the opposition were mostly cultural. They weren't oh. science. They weren't questioning the scientific right. thing in large part. In, large, in, in the main, in Europe particularly, it was the desire to try to maintain the traditional type of agriculture. I see. So we just never could get the two sides huh. to even, even on safety issues? Because I know even the opponents issue, often claim that yeah. there are safety problems. Right. So the companies set up trials. They did all kinds of, the FDA approved yeah. many of these things after examining the data. Uh, there was always the problem of dissemination of weeds, right. weeds that would take over. All of these kinds of things arose, and slowly but surely, the scientific data dispelled almost all of them, but never could challenge people at the core values right. of their culture, right. the way right. they felt about right. food, what food meant right. to them. Right. And in many ways, one of the problems, I think, early on, and the ag business recognized it, is all the genetic modifications they were making were to facilitate better yields for the farmers. Right make work easier for the farmers. The public would say, well, what do I get out of it? I'm taking the risk of right. eating something that you tell me is safe, but may turn out not to be safe in the yeah. long run. So why should I take that risk when all it's doing is making yeah. the farmer's job easier yeah. and richer? So, so is this a case maybe of the scientific community not finding the right way to explain or the right message or the right Well, I'm not right sure how, what kind of message you could do because it's, we'll get to well, it in a moment. You could tell people that it would make food less expensive for them or more nutritious. All of those arguments were made. And, and they, didn't, those, they didn't work. No. And I, my own view, thought ultimately the shopper is going to walk into a market and see two bins and there's the bin that was genetically modified and there's the wild type yeah. and the price is going to be half for the genetically modified and they're going to have to make a choice yeah. and they'll begin to the pocketbook again will be free, you know, free markets right. sometimes right. correct these yeah. things now, right yeah now the issue of culture is the same thing with the recombinant with the uh, stem cell issue yeah yeah so we i don't know how many meetings when the embryonic stem cell issue arose yeah there was the violent opposition coming from essentially the, the cultural right wing, but the religious organizations, and then people who themselves felt deeply about the sanctity of life and 
the anti-abortion constituency. Right. So everything was opposed to the recombinant to the uh, embryonic stem cell work. Um, I don't know how many meetings I attended where these two constituencies tried met, to resolve their and yeah. it was like talking by each other, yeah. Yeah. talking right past each other. You could not persuade those who felt deeply and conscientiously about sanctity of life that you couldn't convince them that this little blastocyst was not a definition of life. Right. And, that and that's not so well understood when people want to say, well, let's have a conference and bring these yeah. two opposing views yeah. together. Yeah. They have to be views that are willing to listen to each other yeah. and, and that there's some give and take as there was in the recombinant DNA. And in some right. of these other things, there yeah. is no middle ground. Well, and of course, with embryonic stem cells, the Congress got into the act very quickly very in this quickly. case, didn't they? Yes. So you testified, I know, in a number of hearings in the Senate. Yes. Were you in one of the first ones? I was, I don't know, in any number Early, of them. Right? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and what you, you could see, what was being played out was this cultural, religious yeah. perspective against the scientific opportunities. Yeah. And it was easy for that other side to poo-poo the scientific opportunities. Yeah. And in fact say, well, you haven't done it yet. And you'd argue, well, we can't do it yet because you won't allow us to do That's it. That's the nature so of research, it was yes, a kind right. Of a, I think if I look back on that whole period, um, the scientific community coming together, at least in California, yeah. uh, and being able to get embryonic stem cell work approved, making the case to the public and getting yeah. an almost overwhelming approval, um, was another example where the scientific community used its um, reputation for, and, and, I, and I'm going to go back and say a little more set a tone. The scientific learn to trust the scientists. My engagement in that public policy debate wasn't as um, rewarding as the recombinant DNA well, it's one. Not because, over yet. Yeah, because, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, I'm going to just admit to something which I have admitted to a number of people. During that entire debate, I, along with most of us, said adult stem cells weren't ever going to be useful. We have to rely on embryonic right. stem cells. And I think today there's more work going on and more interesting things going on with adult stem cells. Well, there's terrific work going on with both. With both. Right. But I think what I found is dismissing the utility of adult stem cells yeah. when, in fact, more and more of them are being sure. cultured and propagated and maintained. And in terms of the debate about embryo versus yep. adult, I think the most immediate benefits are going to come out of either adult somatic stem cells from various tissues yep. or from the iPS cells, the cells that have been where adult stem cells have been converted to embryonic-like. Yep cells. And I think uh, the debate was good to have. Yep. Um, and in the end, I think we have progress, which yep. was important. There's good science happening, yep. which is what really matters, yep. right, in all, on all fronts. Yeah. Now, just to take the lesson, Silomar, one step further, are there going to be other problems that are going to arise? Well, this is what I was going to ask you. I mean, yeah. you know, looking forward, yep. Doesn't all new technology bring new ethical challenges? More and more, a big one that's ongoing now is synthetic biology. Yep. Okay? Now you can make <laughs> organisms make anything. Yep. And I have defended that and actually been involved with things. And I'm a strong advocate. Yep. But there are people saying, yes, but. And the yes, but is what are the nasty things you can do with the same technology? Yep. And I think we're going to have to work through that. So the government, again, has set up a, um, a very strong panel to oversee the developments of synthetic biology. And several interesting things have developed. So for example, these commercial places that will make DNA for you mm -hmm. now have a rigorous protocol that they have to examine a request to make a particular DNA sequence. Uh -huh. They have to translate it and see what it, in fact, will kind of protein it will make, I see. Uh, who's going to use it. Uh, there's a lot of things before they will actually make it and approve it. So 
the idea that some weirdo is going to send in a request for some nasty small pox or DNA whatever, yeah, or whatever right. it's, it's uh, always the it's unlikely scenario. to yeah. be done. Yeah. So, but but nevertheless, synthetic biology is confronting an issue of creating microbes that will be making biofuels. Yeah. And I'm absolutely astonished and amazed about what people are actually doing. I mean, Craig Venter is making whole chromosomes. Yep. Jay Kiesling is, is turning out organisms that are using biomass. Yep. The organism programmed to actually digest cellulases and xyloses and convert them into sugar internally yep. and make long chain fatty steroid fatty acids that are being used to drive trucks. So you, so you sound very optimistic that we I can both solve the technical as well as the uh, safety concerns I here. think the Genome Project has provided an extraordinary library of information of genes. When you think not, about- From not just humans, but from all organisms. All organisms. Right, right. So you can go to an organism that sweet wormwood plant yeah. and take out three genes yeah. and put them in E. coli so they make now artemisin. What the heck is artemisin? Artemisin <laughs> is the major drug now being used for treatment of drug-resistant malaria. Oh. Okay? Oh. And so it's a very complicated molecule. Yeah. And so it's costly to synthesize yeah. by usual yeah. procedures. Isolating it from the plant is very complicated. Right. Right. So Jay <laughs> pulled out the three genes that carry out the last yep. three steps of the yep. synthesis of artemisin, engineered the steroid pathway of E. coli. Incredible. So you make a precursor, and with the three enzymes from, Arte from the wormwood plant, they pour out artemisin. In. Incredible. And now big plant actually manufacturing on a commercial scale. So you can make an anti-malaria drug in an E. coli fermenter. In an E. coli fermenter. Incredible. Okay, and that is now making kerosene, it's making airplane fuels. So, so in retrospect, you, you took an enormous leap when you walked out of the lab and decided to spend some time working with the public. Um, is, that a, is that a good model going forward? Do we need more of that? Do we need less of it? What are your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, there are people who can do this, yeah. um, who are articulate yeah. and persuasive and could play a role, and there are those that can't and won't. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to encourage people because after all, this is our world. The scientific community is, and what we do is, is our world. And if we don't defend it in one way, explain it, yeah. uh, then we're not doing half the job. We publish papers and as a way of communicating what we've done. Mm -hmm. But the general to public each other. doesn't, yeah. uh, the general public doesn't read these papers and they're in the dark. And you're using mumbo jumbo to describe what you do. Well, it's a different and language. So there yeah. are yeah. people who are very skilled and, and enjoy mm -hmm. actually explaining what they do in more general terms to the public. And that's a very valuable thing for those people to do it. Uh, I think we have to clear the path so it's not sacrificing one's career. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, what, if one were to make the argument to some people, they'd say, well, you can only do it after you've gotten a Nobel Prize, well, which means it's a very certain, small population. Is, well, right? okay, it doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize. It right? could be when your career has gelled to the point where you're now recognized so mm -hmm. that, in fact, if you're going to make statements, people will say it's coming from some authoritarian of source. Just built some respect. Right. Yeah. Younger people sometimes say, oh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to get involved in that. I'm in science to do sci experiments. Yeah. But when you grow up, okay, <laughs> and it is when you grow up and you feel assured of, of a modicum of success, that you can go out and do this. Yeah. And you have to do it conscientiously and seriously and honestly. And you have to bring rigorous science to what you do. And you have to bring rigorous do. science. Right. Thank you. Good.